Today's guest is about as San Franciscan as it's possible to be, as you shall see in a few moments. Now, you, I asked this question even though you told me a little while ago. Are you a native San Franciscan? Yes, indeed. I was born here. You, you were born here, and I was told, and I'm going to have you repeat, what about your parents? Were they born here also? My mother was. My father, I don't think, was. Now, do I, I'm trying to recall from our original conversation whether or not you have been interested in your genealogy at all. Do you, do you have a record way back of your family, or, or does it end at your grandparents or great-grandparents? Do you, do you happen to have that record? Well, my daughter has done some researching on my mother's family, mm -hmm. and they came from, they were Scotch-Irish. Yes. But well, your mother's name, what was their what was their family name? Ferguson. Ferguson, I see, yes. yes. That's Scotch. Yes. And they uh, came, my grandmother came to the United States after the potato famine in Ireland. Oh, yes. Her father was a linen merchant, and there was really, I don't think they were ever actually hungry, but there was so much difficulty at that time that she came to New York as a young girl about 18. Approximately what year would that be? Oh, that must have been about 1840. About 1840. Oh, yes. Yeah. Now, did your mother tell you any stories now or rather, you, I think of, of, of life uh, af here in San Francisco? Let's say during the time before you were born, do you, did she impress you with the circumstances and with the kind my, of things? My that, mother? Your own mother now. Oh, we, yes. We, yes, indeed she did. The, uh, she was born on Rincon Hill. Oh, on Rincon Hill, yes. Yes. And as a little girl, she played down among the boats on the beaches of Lincoln Hill because Lincoln Hill was like Telegraph Hill. It spread out into the, into the bay, a, a nice sandy beach. So that she was a, a real San Franciscan. And in that era, see, that was when Rincon Hill was really a hill. Yes, that's right. And it I, made I, a kind of a, a, a crescent. The harbor was a little crescent between Telegraph Hill and Rincon Hill. Oh, it, it was a sort of a crescent in yes. there. Yes, and as they, as they uh, made the streets for San Francisco, by uh, San Francisco was one great big sand dune covered with lupin bushes. Oh, yes. And as they began to make the street, they would haul some of the sand and dump it into the crescent of the bay until they finally had it pretty well filled up. I recall now seeing an old map whereby San Francisco Bay came up as far as First Street or so, didn't it? I think it came up almost as far as Montgomery. It did. Uh, uh, it did on the north side of Market. Yes, yes. Yes. And uh, of course, we have a street named Front Street. So. So that was. And Beach Street. <laughs> and uh, yes, and and Beach Street. That that is right. So that this has all been filled in there, and of course, recently when they were building the building, this ship they found. There mm -hmm. is evidence uh, of that, of course. By the way, where in San Francisco were you born? You, you, what, where were you born? Your mother was born on Rincon Hill. Where were you born? Well, I was actually born in San Mateo. They were down there for the summer vacation. Oh, yes. You, but, you did, however, your parents had a residence in the city at the time. Yes, it was mm -hmm. being built at that time mm -hmm. on Broadway and the Visadero. Oh, yes. Which, is that particular building still uh, yes. standing? In fact, I think it's Aliotto's son who owns it now. Oh, is that right? <laughs> you mean the former mayor, Joe Aliotto's son? Yes, that's right. Oh, yes. Well, that's interesting. Well, it is being lived in then and has been kept in good repair. Yes. I exactly. have found, interestingly enough, that some of the folks born in San Francisco have their, their, their original homes, of course, have gone the way of, of all buildings in yes. that they have been taken down for reconstruction or, or some other thing. Now, then... Do you, do you have any recollections of your very first entrance into a San Francisco school or your, your study? I happen to know some of the part of the answer, but I want you to answer it if you will. Uh, you, did you attend the San Francisco public schools at all? No, but the schools were not very good in those days. Uh, and I, we, my sister and myself had a had just the governess who taught us reading and writing. Oh, yes. You told me a little bit about this, and I thought it was a good story, and, and I'd like to have you repeat it as much as you can remember or, or would like to, because uh, 
do you remember some of the th- let's let's say for example that uh, your father had to do with helping this governess or teacher that you had to begin to take in additional students and become an established school. Is that not correct? Well, it wasn't this teacher. The first oh, teacher I see. We it had was the was governess a, to begin with. It was mm-hmm. governess to begin mm-hmm. with. But later on, I did go to Miss West's school in those days, and I was in the sixth grade, and my teacher was Miss Burke, Miss Catherine Delmar Burke, and I was very fond of her. And she became acquainted with my mother because I, she taught me at school. And she said she wanted to found her own school someday. So my mother lent us some money and encouraged her to do so, and that was the beginning of Burke School. That's an interesting story. And you were there firsthand and and perhaps one of uh, two or three of the first students, is that correct? Yes, one of six. One of six. And three little sisters. Well, they were in different grades, of course, so that she was teaching at that time all of the studies necessary for several different grades. Is that right? Yes. Well, we were all about the same grade who started the school, so she taught us reading, writing, and arithmetic. Did you go at an early hour to that school? Did you, for example, did you arrive at school at eight o'clock or nine o'clock? What eight, time eight in the morning? Thirty. Eight thirty. You used to go to school, and then, yeah. then you had your normal recesses. I presume the same as a public school would have had. Or yes. did you have well, uh, that just, sort of a break? We just went in the morning. We didn't go in the afternoon. There was no afternoon session. I see. You, do, do, you, do you feel that, that you were given uh, adequate knowledge or adequate lessons? Were they, were they hard lessons? Do you remember that they were difficult for you? Oh, I don't remember that they were difficult, but we certainly were well educated. Miss Burke was a brilliant, had a brilliant mind and a very dramatic way of teaching. She could get us into into a state of tears or laughter at a moment's notice. And I remember that when we were studying Greek history and she said, the, uh, the Greek fleet sailed from the Pir- Piraeus never to return. She had us all in tears. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah. This, this is a talent all in itself, isn't yes, it? Yes, it is. Yes. The other thing I think about, can I go back to your tutor? When you were first tutored before you went to Miss Burke School, yes. did you, how, how much time uh, did you spend with the tutor? Did the tutor come to your home? Yes. I see. Right. So that uh, they came perhaps for half a day? Yes, or, is, is that right. Is that so yes, that that's... it was not a full day session? But no. they again would have the time to give you the individual uh, instruction that was certainly uh, most helpful. Yes, that's uh, right. Even though I haven't had the opportunity or never did uh, have reason, although I, I, I have too. I, on certain courses in chemistry, I remember in school that I did go to an instructor uh, for tutoring yeah. so that I, I do have some semblance of knowledge on, on what that is. Well, then, you were taught in your home. You went to Miss Burke's school. And your assignments were effective, certainly, because you have been successful throughout your life. And were you given a diploma or a certificate of proficiency? How, what was the status of learning at that time? Did they, did I don't remember. You what? don't remember? You don't have it today, then, <laughs> I, I presume. But at least you felt that you, you had adequate knowledge. Yeah. And I wondered about that. Today, of course, you can get a certificate for most, most anything you do. <laughs> yes. And, uh, but then, then you did follow through and you did attend college. Am I correct? Yes, I went the first year of college, and it was the First World War, and then I married. This, I gave up college and got married because my uh, fiancé was going off to France. Oh, yes. Well, then that must have been in 1916 or 17, right? Yes, that's right. In, in 19... And, and uh, so that you were left here, and of course, I feel certain he did return, and uh, or were you married before he went? We married before he went. Oh, oh, he did. Oh, I see. So that he was there, and did he see action? Your husband see action? No, he didn't. He didn't, I see. Yes, he was there just a month as the armistice. Oh, yes. Of course, this, uh, I remember such things, but I'm afraid many of our listeners will not. So I I shouldn't talk about things that that, uh, they wouldn't associate with uh, properly. Well, then, during the war, did you take up some kind of work? Did you did you actually work for pay? Let's say for at some firm or a hospital or no, that we, sort of thing. No, we all did volunteer work, rolling bandages and things of that kind, but not being paid for it. You do remember, of course, the flu epidemic, I presume. 
Yes, I had it. <laughs> Did you have it severely? Yes. Did you have yes. a severe case of it? Yes, and my mother performed a cesarean on me. She was a surgeon and a doctor. Oh, is that right? Your mother was a surgeon and a doctor. Yes. And you did well. You had, you had, um, the the influenza. Yes. While you were pregnant, is that right? Yes, that's right. And she performed, and your mother did this. Yes, that's right. This is exciting because I thought there was some deference given a strange doctor as compared to a relative uh, in such instances. But that is not the case. Well, she was the best in the city in that particular line. I see. And so you couldn't very well, uh, uh, or no one would, make any attempt to change that. That, That's 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 interesting. And And there's another interesting thing is my son is a surgeon, and he one time operated on on me for a hernia. So I think he says I'm the first woman who's ever been operated on by her mother and her son. That is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Well, let's see now. We didn't get you to college, and I want I want to know about your college days. Well, I was only there, you see, a part of the first year, and I then see. I got married. Then, then you you were married, and you did have you you had no reason then to return, or you didn't return no. to to college in any in any event. Well, that's what I wasn't clear, and in the short discussion I had with you before. I didn't, I didn't pick up uh, that kind of a detail. Well, now, I want to get into the thing that you have done over a great many years, and I'd like to know if you'll tell me how you became interested in promoting the, ideas, uh, the idea of open spaces in San Francisco, or I'm sure that your interest is not limited to San Francisco, if, if I uh, assume correctly. Yes, well... It's a very natural thing. You live in a city that's only that's in the building. And where we lived on Broadway and Visadero Street, there were lupin bushes and sand dunes as far as the eye could see almost. So you saw that the city begin to fill up with people. And after a certain point, the filling up process was, was anything but uh, welcome. You wanted the open spaces. You wanted something left. Was As this personal was. now? This is, you, your own feelings were that you were being surrounded, is that right? Yes, but I wasn't the only one. We, almost every San Franciscan who had grown that up that in, in the city felt the, the crowding of people into the city after the First World War. So that your interest in, in working toward open spaces is not, wasn't new. It originated almost by yourself with other neighbors. That's right. And, uh, and you continued it on for uh, the balance of your life so far. Well, it isn't the balance of your life. Pardon me, that's the wrong expression <laughs> for, for uh, your life from that time to, to, till today. That's at right. Least. Well, this is exciting. Well, follow that through for me, will you? Because I want, I want you to tell everything you can about your open space interest and what you have done about it and uh, uh, to promote it and how you believe it will be beneficial. Well, in the 30s, during the Roosevelt era, uh, I became interested in civic affairs and we, we uh, did a lot about public housing at that time. And in the course of that, city planning became very interesting to us. And in the late 30s, I and other young students from the University of California did a great deal to establish the city planning department in San Francisco. It hadn't existed before. So city planning uh, was my great interest from that point on, city planning and open space as part of the balance of of density of a city as against uh, urban sprawl out into the country and the destruction of farmland. Would you believe that if my arithmetic is correct, this has been a matter of 60 years that you have been working in this direction? More or less. Yes. <laughs> you know, you are given credit for effectively working for the passage of Proposition J in 1974. Now, I presume you had lots of help, of course, mm-hmm. and, but that was to establish uh, open spaces. Will you tell us a little bit about what that uh, how you worked on that, what you did to promote it, and it was passed, of course, so Yes, as it, was, a it was a charter amendment which permitted uh, the city to set aside something like three million a year for 15 years to buy the last hilltops, the last shoreline, the last empty spaces in San Francisco so that we would have some sort of a balance of, of our community of dense city living as against open space for parks. 
Tell me, how has it worked out? Has it been? Has it operated satisfactorily? Has the city performed on the yes, uh, on yes. Proposition J? Yes, we worked for about two years until Proposition Thirteen was passed, uh, and we have we have purchased all the last hilltops in San Francisco. They all, as uh, and it's quite interesting. Those last hilltops amounted to seven acres, and we have paid for those seven acres one million seven hundred thousand dollars. Is that right? This shows how little the word gets around, even though you have a successful operation. I was not aware that the last hilltops have been purchased yes. as a, a preservation activity by the city. Yes, that's right. That is exciting. And I now begin to understand a little bit of why you have a hilltop named after you. <laughs> well, we uh, the Proposition J that was passed in 1974 made it a charter amendment to put aside these $3 million to buy the last hilltop yes. for 15 years. Now, there's so we a, had to have the money to do it. Sure, it, it takes that, and you had yes. to have the cooperation of the city. And, of course, when it's it, this was a charter amendment, right? Yes, this was and a charter amendment. And this voted by an made initiative. it possible for the Board of Supervisors to to uh, approve the money, and, and then it became it became a fact. That That's wonderful. Yes, uh, that, they, that they is, didn't even great. have to approve it. It was just a part of the law. It was just a part of the law, yes. And it was passed by an initiative. I have, uh, you mentioned, too, that you've got a new program that you will be expounding on. May I say that word, expounding, uh, uh, be talking about, let's say. And that is that the San Francisco Presidio may already be declared surplus by the federal government. Perhaps it is to be shortly. And you have some ideas about that. Is that right? Well, I heard that rumor the other day, and following it through the next day, I found that that uh, uh, plan has been sent back to Congress for restudying. So I don't think it's an immediate problem, thank goodness. It has been in the news enough uh, times recently that it eventually may come to pass, however. Yes, it, it could be. But I was also assured that if it ever did become so, it would be part of the GGNRA, the... the, uh, uh, the the natural resource recreation area. Oh yes, this was that. A, a, was that what they call a reliable source that told you this? Sometimes they say things that are not necessarily going to come to pass. Well, I rang up the uh, Fort Mason the headquarters of the GGNRA, and they said that it certainly wouldn't be sold to private enterprise at any rate. It would be part of that program. Well, this this makes sense. It's a beautiful yes. piece of land, uh, prime as far as all of the Western United States is concerned. I feel, yes, I, I, I feel that. certainly. Now, the thing I'd like to have you tell us is to explain a little bit on how uh, you go about getting support for your open space plans, uh, particularly in San Francisco, but any place in California that are interested in an open space program. What might you suggest they do? to get interest? Well, I think the first thing is to form a coalition of the already existing conservation groups in that area, whatever they may be. How many of them would you say are in San Francisco? There must be a good number. We have about 18 on our list. There are 18 in San Francisco. Yes, and then you call a meeting of some kind with representatives from all of those organizations, and you lay before them a proposition of some kind that we must defend our open spaces, our hilltops, and our shoreline, and keep them for the public. Yes, now, those people are all uh, thinking citizens who have considered what is good and followed it through in that way, and you must then have the legal talent necessarily to occasionally uh, uh, check on the legality or to work on the legality of certain uh, properties. Is that correct? That's correct, but there are always plenty of lawyers around to instruct you. Yes, I, I should say that is right. There are plenty around. I, what I had thought was that you might have some volunteer lawyers in your organization that, that, would, that the, would possibly give you, well, set you right on such things. Well, it always is so, too. <laughs> Let's say that I wanted to do something positive to promote open spaces 
in San Francisco, what would I do? I'd talk to you first. That's what I know I would do. <laughs> but but what would what would anyone listening do who may not uh, wish to either call or, or contact you? In other words, there 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 is a piece of property that looks like it should be preserved. What what would what would you suggest I do about it? Well, at the present time, there's a program emanating from the Natural Resource Agency. It's a state agency, and Huey Johnson is the head of it. And he was the president of the Trust for Public Land before he was appointed by Brown oh, yes. to this position. So he's a great conservationist, and he has a program of forestation in the cities, of planting trees in cities right now, and uh, setting aside certain land for vegetable gardens in the city. Now, the uh, organization to which he was the president before he became the Natural Resource Agency director has a program of urban, a little urban trust whereby uh, volunteers in certain neighborhoods can work in a framework that is legal, a little trust, and they uh, uh, develop say, the vacant lots in their neighborhood and plant them in vegetable gardens. And the uh, Trust for Public Land tries to get that private land into public land. Either oh, yes. By purchase or some other way. Oh, yes. I'm going to ask you the only uh, questionable question of today. You know, San Francisco has a limited space. Let me ask you this question, if I may. Isn't it more important to have housing and buildings than more open spaces? Well, for I, the economics of it, let's say? I think you simply have to have parks for people. The more crowded they become, the more they need those parks and open spaces. Uh, what about the, the economics of, of it? Have you, have you delved into that? Is there something that I might find to read telling us about economics and that sort of thing? Well, of course, uh, if the land is owned by the city, they don't, don't pay taxes on it. Truly, there is a loss so in there, taxes. But yes. we haven't so many... Uh, vacant lots that would make any appreciable difference. It wouldn't. You, you think then that that the open spaces wherever we can get them is um, they're limited. Is, is, I know you believe this, incidentally, yes. but I wanted to ask you the question, and then I want to ask you another question. What do you think? Do you think these open spaces are going to continue to exist through the year two thousand and beyond? It all depends. If they're made into a park, they probably will. If they become under the under the public yes. uh, control yes, and right. under the control of organizations such as those you belong to, you yes. believe that they will then they will then the become, title will run with the land. You know, what would you like to say? Do you know? Do you would you believe we're running short on time? No. I would like to have you make a statement about open spaces in the next uh, oh fifteen or twenty seconds. What would you say? What you might like to say? in the interest of open spaces? Well, I think we should consider the, the open spaces surrounding our cities as just as important as, as uh, the land where the tall, the high-rise buildings go. Uh, we need, on the outside of our cities, a fringe of open space for recreation and for, for beauty and for certain a farmland that would be close into the cities things of that kind. Our time has run out. And nearly every guest wish, makes me wish we could arrange a repeat, and we'll try to think about this at a future time. And I hope you will. If we give you a call, as I did this time, we'll get together because we haven't covered the whole thing by any means. Thank you, Dorothy Erskine. I'm Truman Ball, speaking for the San Francisco History Room and City Guides at the main library in the Civic Center. I'll be back in a week at the same time with a guest who will have a story to tell that will help us to understand San Francisco better than ever. So one more time, I truly do thank you for listening. Good day.